Hello, hello. Welcome into the Audio Ground School podcast. My name is Nick Smith, founder and creator of Part Time Pilot and the Audio Ground School podcast. I'm your host. Thank you for joining me. This is the podcast where we go through the Part Time Pilot online ground school for private pilots every single lesson in detail. I like to try and add different, maybe some examples, some real life stories to try and add to those that are listening to the lessons. And then when there's any visual aids, which we have a lot of in the ground school lessons, I try and explain those as best I could using metaphors and examples and things that you can maybe picture in your head. So in today's episode, we are continuing on our section on emergencies. And so if you're following along in the ground school, this is section 17 of your step one course. So we sort of organize everything by courses inside your private pilot membership. So we have a step one course that's got all the lessons, videos, diagrams, quizzes, audio lessons, all that stuff. Then step two is practice tests. And then when you take those practice tests, we give you a, a custom report, give you more practice tests if you need them, or if you want the practice, go over your report, stuff like that. And then step three is your endorsement. So that's kind of how we, we lay it out. So it's a step one course and it's section 17 of that on emergencies. And in the last episode, we covered types of emergency landings and landing spot selection, the first two lessons of that section. And today we're going to cover electrical failures, gyro failures, and radio failures. So we're going to do three lessons today. They're all kind of short lessons, but we'll kind of talk about those things a little bit. So it should be great. Before we get started, you know, we do a student question of the day. We're going to do that today. We read off a couple of reviews. We got some new reviews. Thank you guys for that. If you want a review read out you know, loud here on the podcast, you want that chance, uh, you can go to trustpilot.com, search part-time pilot, leave us a review there. I highly, highly would appreciate it. But even better and even more appreciated is if you leave us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. So if it's on Spotify or Apple or Google Play, I think it is, those are all the most popular. I think you can use star ratings on Spotify and on Apple, you can do a star rating and then leave like some words and stuff. And that would really, really help us get seen more. So appreciate that. A couple announcements. One announcement is our next scholarship. So those of you that follow us know that we do four scholarships a year. And they used to be all $1,000 and all of them were only to our online ground school members. And then we started to get, you know, the podcast kind of took off a little bit got some popularity, you know, we got some followers on Instagram, N nothing crazy. I'm no celebrity or anything, but we had a little bit of a following. And so I thought, how can I use this, you know, to good use? So I thought of, well, I could do some ads on the podcast. So that's what I've been trying to do. And then what the people who pay in for the ads, right, they, they pay in for that money, all that money is going to go to scholarship stuff. And then I can do other sorts of things. I And we came up with a GoFundMe. And so this is for our spring scholarship. And last year was the first time we did it in our in the spring. So it's going to be near the end of May. We did this spring scholarship where we did a GoFundMe and people just donated, you know, $10 here. Some people donated like $100 or whatever you could give. And we ended up raising like $6,000, or $6,000. And then we give it all away. I don't keep any of it. And that's why I use GoFundMe. So it's like transparent. You know, so you can see exactly how much goes in and then you can see how much goes out by the people that, that get the scholarships. And last year I chose the scholarship winners myself, but this year I think that should be you guys as well. So this year we're going to kind of do like a, a little vote on who should win. So we're going to all pick some finalists to make it a little easier. And then we'll have the finalists create a video submission and I'll put those videos on social media and then you guys vote on who you think the winners should be. So that's what we're going to do this year. And our goal is to raise $10,000. So I'm going to put that GoFundMe. We already have a GoFundMe. I already donated $1,000. Then we had a plain English that we love. They donated about $1,000 or yeah, I think we're at $2,300. And then Fly Like a Local, another cool app that helps student pilots. So if you haven't heard of plain English, AR Sim or Fly Like a Local, go check those out. They're our sponsors so far this year for the scholarship. Huge shout out to them. But yeah, so we're at $2,300 already. We haven't even done any of the GoFundMe yet, and I'm still looking for some more sponsors. So one, if you know of any, you know, aviation type companies that might want to get in front of some student pilots like yourself who might want to spend their money on a good cause, then let me know. And then two, if you have anything, I know flight training is expensive, but if you, if you sit back and you look and you, 
say, you know what, I'm pretty fortunate right now. I, I can give a little bit, even if it's five, ten dollars. We'll put that GoFundMe in the show notes. And I struggled at first to ask people for money. So I don't want you guys to do it if it's gonna hurt you in any way, if it's gonna break your bank or anything, don't do it. Don't worry about it. And I wouldn't ask you it if I didn't feel that, you know, I was in integrity and doing it myself. That's why I donate the thousand dollars. That's why we also give out three one thousand dollar scholarships every year and then runners up for free ground school. So please, if you don't feel this right, then no worries, don't do it. And then uh if you want to apply for that, we will be posting that link to apply sometime beginning to mid-May. So stay tuned for that. All right. The other announcement is we released our IFR beta course and that was a smashing hit. So it was a hundred dollars off with the understanding that it's not yet finished. We still have some videos to make, some audio lessons to create, things like that, the finishing touches. However, it has everything in there that you would need, all the written lessons, the visual aid, the quizzes, the practice tests, everything you need to go through, learn everything, and then get endorsed by us to take the IFR written exam. So it's complete in that regard, but it's not up to the standard of our private pilot test. So I'm going to wait to officially, our private pilot course, sorry, to officially release that once that's complete, but the beta, we wanted some beta founding member users to kind of help us in, give us feedback in return, right? And then in return, we gave it to them a hundred dollars off for lifetime access. We wanted 25 people and our site, our website actually crashed. It's the first time I didn't even know this was possible. So that was two things, two feelings at the same time. One it was super awesome to be like, wow, is this popular, right? I remember the first time I launched my course, I was just hoping to get like one person. So that's really cool. And then second thing, it was kind of a bummer because it made one, a lot of work. A lot of people were kind of frustrated because the link wasn't working for them. And then two, it frustrated me because the server company that I use for my website, it should handle that. It's not like I'm like, you know, amazon.com handling millions of people a day or anything like that. Like it should have handled like a few hundred people or whatever the total number was. So, but I guess it was all at one time, right at, you know, when we released it at 4 p.m., I still need to call into my server company and be like, hey, what the heck? Like, you should be able to handle this, no problem. Anyway, so that was really cool. I just want to thank everybody who joined the IFR beta as a founding member. We're already getting feedback and incorporating that in. And we hope to have the full IFR course ready in about a month and a half to two months. So stay tuned for that as well. Okay, enough of that stuff. Important information for those who are considering either IFR or getting a scholarship. Let's read off just real quickly a couple of reviews. Again, if you want to leave us a review, you can go to where you listen to podcasts or go to trustpot.com, search for part-time pilot. This first one's from Sandy. Thank you, Sandy, for your review. It's five stars. It says instead of buying or instead of studying five textbooks and five other guides, this is more conventional, comprehensive, and effective. It has built my confidence. That is short and sweet and a great review. I appreciate it. And that is so true. I know a lot of people, they have all these bundles of books or they come to us, they get our ground school and they say, hey, what else do I need? My This flight school said I need this book, this book, this book. I'm like, you don't need anything. <laughs> like we got it all. We got the test prep book. When you can download, we got, you know, study guides, flashcards, practice tests, quizzes, lessons, videos. It's all in there. So one-stop shop is the goal. So thanks, Sandy. The second uh, review that we'll read is from Alex, five stars, having access to the podcast, Great tool to use while either at work, in the gym, or while driving. All right. Thanks, Alex. I won't say your last name since you did say that you use it while you're at work. (laughs) Don't want to get you in trouble. But yeah, I I remember the day that I I remember thinking of the podcast. I had always wanted to do a podcast. I thought it was cool. I love podcasts myself. And I love that I can listen while I work, listen while I drive, listen while while I walk, while I work out, all that stuff. I love the dishes, it makes those other things, it makes my mind get off those other things that I usually don't like doing, right? So I love podcasts myself, so I always wanted to do one. I never, I was like, what am, What topics am I going to Am I going to have guests on? Am I going to, I was like, it felt like a lot of work. And I also wanted it to be, you know, valuable because that's one of the things I always try and do. And then it hit me, let me just read off the ground school. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys for your reviews. Actually, let's do one more. This one's five stars from Jonathan. The information is very easy to follow format. Quizzes at the end of the lessons are helpful to reinforcing knowledge. I learned a lot in the course, which helped me earn a 93% on the written exam. This made the oral portion of my check ride go very smoothly. 
Awesome. Jonathan, I remember he posted in our Facebook study group about his 93. So we're seeing a nine, lot of 93s lately. That seems to be the go-to score for students in our class, which is a great score. So good job, Jonathan, and thank you for that review. All right, let's move on to the student question. So this was a, a great question, one we've been asked before, and we got a lot of great feedback in the study group. And if you're not in our Facebook study group, I highly recommend that you join that. I'll put that link in the show notes along with the scholarship GoFundMe. This whole thing, if you went through the whole thing, it is such a wealth of knowledge in the Facebook study group. I remember when it started, you know, trying to encourage people to post and all the stuff. And now it's just, it's a living and breathing ecosystem all of its own. It's great. And so not only if you ask a question in there, will we answer it, but you're going to get an answer from a ton of different perspectives. You might get an answer from a new student pilot who just went through that lesson. You might get a, a perspective from a someone who just became a private pilot and now working on IFR or something. Or you might get perspective from a, a private pilot who's been a pilot, you know, flying for 30 years. Or you might get a perspective from a CFI. We have a bunch of CFIs in there, a bunch of ground instructors. So many different perspectives are in this ground school and people love to chat about this stuff. I mean, who doesn't? So getting the different perspectives on it, sometimes, you know, certain concepts are hard to understand. If, you know, one person's answer doesn't hit for you, another perspective might hit or the combination of the two might hit for you. And this question is a perfect example of that. So the question was, they said, it's from Tristan. Well, it's official. I'm more confident landing a plane than talking to people on ATC. Any tips on how to talk to ATC and get over the fear of it? I love this because I'm right there with you, Tristan. Like even today, I know you guys are like, oh, you have a podcast, you make all these videos, but talking to people makes me nervous. And so um much more confident flying a plane by myself than, than talking to people. But I've gotten used to it, the practice and stuff for ATC. So this got a bunch of responses, 25 different responses. So I'm just going to summarize some of the most said tips and some of the ones that I like the best for how to practice talking to ATC and kind of get over that fear. These are in no particular order. I'm just going to go down here and kind of, they're going to jog my memory and I'll say them how I do, but they are going to be, I don't know, maybe three to five of my favorite ones. All right. So the first one is, it's all about kind of not just spitting out words, but actually paying attention and comprehending. I thought this was a great, unique perspective on it. Actually comprehending what ATC is saying. So let's say, you know, ATC says taxi via Bravo, turn left on Bravo four, stop short, runway two seven, whatever, you know, something like that. I just came up with that. I don't even know. But if you were just to not have your taxi diagram out and have a visual comprehension of what they just said, it would be a lot harder, especially if they said it fast and they said a bunch of other stuff, right? It's much easier if you comprehend and you have that taxi diagram and you can kind of almost just draw it out in your mind while you kind of jot notes down. So that's the other key is like jot notes down and learn to of what to jot down, right? But we'll get to that tip. So yeah, I mean, comprehend and look. And if you're flying and you get one, like comprehend what they actually are telling you rather than just memorizing words, that's going to help you. And it's going to help you know what to expect next because you guys are on the same page. So that one was a really good one. This one was said a lot is liveatc.net. They just have a bunch of recordings of ATCs all over the US and you can just click and listen in. You can even listen to past recordings and find you know different situations that you want. So that is a really cool thing. You just listen in and you'll hear the pilot, you'll hear ATC, and you can put yourself in the pilot's shoes and kind of practice that way. That is really helpful. The next one is they happen to be a sponsor of our scholarship. And I'm not just saying that because they sponsored the scholarship. It's actually a really, really cool app and it's called Plain English. And they are Aviation Radio Simulator or AR Sim. Wherever you get your apps, you can look up AR Sim. I'll put a link in the show notes and you can actually get 10% off. Another cool thing they did for our users to their subscription services. So that's really cool. And they have like every single situation you say it into your phone and then it gives you feedback on what to say and then teaches you and plays what the correct thing will say. So it's almost like a very interactive way to learn all the different situations there. Private pilot, ground, private pilot, you know, clearances, takeoff, flight following, all the situations for private pilot. Then they have IFR, like 
everything in there, all these different modules. You could sign up for diff whichever one that's right for you for a low monthly cost, and then you can get another 10% off with the coupon code, which I believe is part-time 10. But look in the show notes. We'll put that in the show notes. So that's a really good tool as well. And then let me scroll down here. We got Live ATC Net. Oh, someone wrote out a cheat sheet, and this is awesome. They actually posted it, and it's fantastic that they put in their kneeboard. And this was one of the recommendations that I had was to think ahead of what your flight's going to be. Because we pilots, we plan. If we're doing something that we didn't plan on our flight, things are going bad already, then you're probably, the way you talk to ATC is kind of out the window. That's probably like an emergency situation, right? But you're going to know what you have planned for your flight, right? You're going to know, hey, I'm going to taxi from my flight school, for example, to this runway, probably, unless the winds change, then maybe this runway. But you're going to have a general idea. Then I'm going to take off and I'm going to fly to the east and I'm going to get this clearance from flight following and I have my flight plan. And then I'm going to be passed off to this station here on my way. Let's say it's a cross country on my way. They'll pass me off to this station. And, and of course, like things might pop up, right? They might tell you some traffic in your area. They might have you change altitudes or vector you or something not expected. But those are pretty generally easy to read back, right? The big long calls are, are the initial calls, the clearance calls, taxi, way well, take off, that sort of stuff. And those are the ones who, as student pilots that, you know, when you're getting comfortable and confident doing these things that you'll struggle with. And so what my whole point is, you can write out exactly what you expect to say in your kneeboard. You can have a cheat sheet that's taxi, right? Taxi cheat sheet takeoff cheat sheet, flight following cheat sheet, like all these. And you can even leave like little blanks in, like maybe instead of the tail number, maybe you could have a new sheet for every flight because you might have a different plane. So you might change the tail number, right? Or you might change the runway number right before you, you know, that could be part of your taxi checklist or, or pre-taxi checklist where you fill in that little sheet, that cheat sheet. And then if anything changes, you can alter accordingly, but you're going to be well prepared for exactly what to say. And this goes on to the next comment here is to pregame it. And that is like practice it before. So you can do this both, let's say at home the night before you can chair fly. You can visualize. I'm a huge believer in visualizing. You can visualize your entire flight and visualize saying it to ATC. Once you've done it in your mind, once your mind doesn't know the difference. And so the next time you do it in real life, your mind's going to think you've already done it. The other thing is you can say it right before. Right, So you can practice with your flight instructor or to yourself without keying the mic. Just practice what you want to say. Practice thinking in your mind what they're going to read back and then have something to expect to read back on and boom. So again, practice makes perfect. Pre-game it. That's another good one. And the last one that I want to mention is to tell them that you are a student pilot. ATC, most of the time, are they're pretty nice people. But sometimes they do this so often and sometimes they could be having bad days. Maybe they're a little grouchy. They can be a little intimidating. This does happen. And so if you mention that you're a student pilot, they'll know to maybe slow down a little bit, make things a little bit easier on yourself, on you. So just, you know, Cherokee 4, 9 or 8, 5, student pilot, blah, 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 right? Tell them you're a student pilot. It might help things slow down a little bit make it a little bit easier all right so that's it we have a long intro and i know i'm really sorry for those that are ready to get to the lessons today so sorry about that but i think it was a lot of great info so let's move on to those lessons all right so again we're in section 17 of our step one course and that's on emergencies and we're on lesson three of that section on electrical failures want to read out our disclaimer that we have here in the ground school and that I need to say for this podcast. All the numbers and procedures that we talk about are based off common aviation trainer aircraft and are only to be used to help you understand the maneuver or the procedure. You and your instructor must determine these numbers and procedures yourself using the approved flight manual or pilot operating handbook for your aircraft you're using and the situation that you're in. So, this is just a tool to help you learn, give you an idea of some of the stuff that you might do that's common for most aircraft, but might not be specific to your aircraft. So got to say that disclaimer that check with your flight instructor, check with the FAA, check with your specific aircraft's documentation. Okay, electrical failures are 
a category of flight scenarios that don't always classify as an emergency. It depends on the pilot and specific situation that will determine whether you need to declare an emergency for an electrical failure or not. However, it will likely make you divert your aircraft and land as soon as possible. I know that if I have a system fail, that's what I'm going to do. Whether I need to call an emergency or not, I'm going to get down as safely and as possible, right? Safely and as soon as possible. Systems and equipment malfunctions that are not critical to the safety of flight are not considered emergencies unless there are other contributing circumstances which combined with the malfunction make the scenario an emergency. One example of this would be an electrical failure. A full electrical system failure, battery and alternator, would cause the pilot to experience an avionics equipment failure. The electrical failure would not affect the flight controls, engine operations, vacuum pump, or six-pack instruments. Do you need electricity for the engine to run? the propeller to spin, and the wings to create lift? Nope. However, if flying during night or in poor visibility, not having electricity means not having lights, and no lights in the night is certainly an emergency. So again, it depends on the specific situation, and it might also depend on your aircraft. Maybe if you're flying a technically advanced aircraft and your flight display no longer works, that is much different, right? Maybe you're not You haven't flown based off the backups, six-pack instruments that are in your aircraft and your flight display goes out, your GPS goes out. That would be an emergency if you are not used to it. Or if you just feel uncomfortable, right? That is also fine. You are the pilot in command. It is your decision to do that. Okay, so your aircraft receives electricity from two sources. And we mentioned this a long time ago on the podcast when we covered aircraft instrumentation and systems and how it all worked, right? We covered how the electrical system in a general aircraft works, and it receives electricity from two sources, your engine alternator and your battery. If you think you are experiencing electrical failure in flight, you want to check your alternator annunciator light. If the annunciator light is illuminated, then you want to perform the following steps. Again, these steps are for most general aviation aircraft. They might not be for your aircraft, so this is just as a learning tool, okay? Not to be used exactly for your aircraft. Check the ammeter value. If ammeter value is zero, then you want to perform something like this. Alternator power switch off, reduce the electrical load to a minimum, check and reset if needed any alternator circuit breaker switches, alternator power switch on, back on. If power is not restored, alternator power switch off, battery power switch on, reduce the electrical load to a minimum, land as soon as possible. Once on battery power, you can assume about 30 minutes of power left and use radio and other non-essential things like lights and stuff very sparingly. So what did we just do here? Essentially, the ammeter is showing nothing, right? It's at zero. So we're not getting any current through our system. So we give it the old turn it off and turn it back on, right? I don't know how many times I did that with my Nintendo 64 when it wasn't working. I actually saw this online. Someone was saying, what's the silliest, stupidest thing that actually really, really works in your field or something like that? And it was like electronics, turn it off, turn it back on, or like unplug it, plug it back in. Like if you ever like had problems with your router, right? And you call up Comcast or whoever, and they're like, okay, here's the steps. You want you to unplug it and then plug it back in, right? So it really does, even in this situation, right? You're kind of resetting things. And then when you turn it off, we're going to check the circuit breakers. And if any have popped out, we'll pop those back in. And we've reset sort of the system. And then we'll try it again. If it if that doesn't, you know, it could have just shorted out for a little bit because of a circuit breaker popping. So when we reset that, we turn it back on. All could be well. But if not, then we're going to switch to battery. So we're going to turn the alternator power off. We're going to go to the battery. And then now we want to reduce our electrical load to a minimum because we're on the battery and the battery only has a finite amount of power to give us, right? Electrical load to give us. And it's usually about 30 minutes depending on the battery. And again, this could change depending on your aircraft, but that's kind of general for aviation. So we want to land as soon as possible, right? Because we're going to run out of power for 30 minutes. You would want to use radio sparingly. So you might tell ATC, hey, I'm on battery power. So I need to be prioritized 
to get in or I might lose you, right? So just let them know you're on battery power and that you'll be using radio sparingly and they will help you out with that, right? And then unless you absolutely need your lights, maybe just leave your anti-collision light on or something like that and try to reduce everything that you can. Okay, that's if the ammeter value is zero. What if the ammeter value is really high? So if the ammeter value is 20 plus amps above nominal, so you'll have a nominal range that you check during your pre-flight all the time according to your aircraft. If it's much higher, right? You know, not if it's like within plus or minus a, a few amps, but if it's much higher, like 20 amps, this is a sign that something's wrong in the opposite direction, right? In this case, we're going to do alternator power switch on, battery power switch off. If electrical loads are reduced, make electrical load the minimum and then land as soon as possible. If the electrical loads are not reduced, and when I say electrical loads, if the ammeter doesn't reduce, right? That's the electrical load. If the electrical load are not reduced, alternator power switch off, battery power switch on, reduce electrical load to a minimum, land as soon as possible. Again, this is now when we're on battery power. So again, we have about 30 minutes. We want to do like we did before, land as soon as possible, use radio sparingly. So what did we do here? Well, we're kind of trying to find which system, whether the alternator or the battery, is causing this, you know, sort of surge. So we're kind of turning one on with the other off, seeing if that helps. And then we're switching to see if, if the other one helps. And if neither helps, then, then something's up and we could be in danger of causing an overload and losing all power or starting electrical fire or something like that. So we want to get down ASA as safely as possible. All right. So that is the lesson on electrical failure. Again, your aircraft might be different and it might have different sorts of electrical systems, maybe additional steps or checks that are specific to the systems that are on your aircraft. So make sure you check with your specific aircraft for that. All right, so let's move on to lesson four on gyro failures. Gyro failures, this is a, a short lesson. There's less things we can do if our gyro fails. With the electrical system, we could try a couple things. We could try switching some things off, you know, maybe popping in a circuit breaker, replacing a fuse if your aircraft is real old school like that. There's some things we can do as pilots to try and get that electrical system back online. For a gyro failure, usually there's not, not much we can do. The internal gyro, we're not going to pull that out and, and fix that. Or the vacuum system that's kind of internal to the aircraft, we're not going to be able to do anything there. Our options are less. So the procedure is much shorter. So your heading indicator and attitude indicator, and sometimes your turn coordinator, sometimes turn coordinators are electrical powered, sometimes they're gyro powered. And these instruments are powered by a vacuum source and a gyro. There's a vacuum pump attached to the engine. So when the engine spins, it spins that pump, it draws air in, right? We covered all this. And then that makes a suction of air through your gyro and powers your gyro to spin in place, right? And do its gyro magic. <laughs> so if they're all acting funny, then you know something's up with your vacuum system, right? If one of them's acting funny, then maybe it's just a specific issue to that gyro, like uh, it's processed or it's tumbling, which we don't go into too much detail. They don't really test you too much about that on private pilot flight. We talk about procession. Uh, you know, your heading indicator can process over time. So every 30 minutes or so, you want to calibrate that back with your magnetic compass and straight and level flight. Talk about that. We don't really talk about tumble. You know, usually you can't get a gyro attitude indicator gyro to tumble unless you're doing like acrobatic flight or like spin training. Basically why the FAA doesn't talk about it too much for private pilot flight, but it's something you'll learn if you move on to IFR flight. Anyways, those specific errors could be just on one gyro, right? And if it's just happening on one gyro, then you know it's not your vacuum system, likely, right? It's just that specific gyro. So you can do some kind of investigative work based off which instruments are, are working or not. Let's say your multiple gyro instruments are, are working funny. So there's something wrong. You think there's something wrong with your vacuum system. So you want to check the vacuum system, enunciator light. I always struggle with that word. If the enunciator light is illuminated, then, hey, your aircraft is also telling you there's something wrong with your vacuum system. And so you'd want to perform the following steps. And I just want to mention here that even if the enunciator light wasn't illuminated, but all of your vacuum instruments are acting wrong, then 
you as a PIC, because you understand these things at an in-depth level, you could tell that, hey, there's a problem with my enunciator light. There's definitely a problem with my, the fact that my enunciator light is off doesn't mean there's no problem. I can definitely tell that I know this problem. That's why it's so important for pilots to have a deep understanding of these things and not just memorize procedures, right? Like if the enunciator light is on, I'm going to do this. If not, then everything's fine, right? Same goes with the electrical system. If that enunciator light is off, and it's not saying there's an issue, but you can definitely tell that there's an issue because your ammeter is at zero or something like that, then trust your gut and your knowledge and your training. All right, let's just assume you've determined that there's something wrong with the vacuum system, whether that's through the enunciator light or not. This is what you do. You want to check the vacuum indicator gauge. So there should be a gauge that tells you how much suction or flow is going through. I think it's a pressure gauge going through the vacuum indicator. And there, again, there should be a range that that sits at that your, your vacuum regulator keeps it at this specific amount of pressure through the vacuum system. So you want to check that. If it reads zero, then you've lost your vacuum system. You've lost that suction and there's not much you can do in flight. So we're going to use our compass to replace our heading indicator. And that's why we have to learn how to make turns and, and all those pesky compass errors right? In case this happens and we have to use a compass instead of our heading indicator. And then we want to use a combination of a turn coordinator, a VSI, an airspeed indicator to replace our attitude indicator. So again, we talk about this more in IFR flight, but on how exactly you would do that. These instruments, the turn coordinator, the VSI, and the airspeed indicator, and the altimeter as well. So the altimeter, airspeed indicator, and VSI can kind of be like secondary pitch instruments. Basically, they tell you your pitch attitude, and then your turn coordinator, right? That's going to tell you your, your bank attitude. So that's good. We'll use a turn coordinator. And then the VSI airspeed indicator and altimeter, we're going to kind of look at the trends of that, right? So if you pitch up to climb without the attitude indicator, let's say you can't see out the window in this case, that's why we talk about more in IFR flight. Your altimeter should rise, right? Because you climb, your airspeed should go down, and then your VSI should go up. And then when you get to the altitude you want, you would push down on the yoke and, and kind of feel that, but you would know that you've leveled off when all those stop trending in the direction they were and trend in the opposite direction, right? So like VSI would actually trend to zero, airspeed indicator would stop going down and then turn around, and then altimeter would stop going up and then start going down. And that's kind of when you know, okay, that's where I level off right there. Again, you don't have to get into too much details, but you would have to use your other instruments in that way if you lost your vacuum gauge or your vacuum system. So this is not an emergency during VFR, high visibility flight, because we can see out your window. And if you've been flying private pilot for a while, done a, enough flight training lessons, you can do a lot of stuff with just your flight picture, right? Or your sight picture out the window, right? The relationship of your nose with the horizon that's your attitude indicator. You don't really need a lot of your instruments when you have good visibility. Your instruments are important, but you really need your instruments when the visibility is poor and you start getting illusions and things like that, right? I don't mean to poo-poo instruments or anything like that. I'm just saying it's much easier to fly without them when you have VFR, right? It's not exactly an emergency to lose like your attitude indicator or your vacuum system when you have high visibility flight. So if this happened to you in high visibility VFR, maybe just perform a safe as soon as possible diversion because and tell ATC, hey, this is what's up. I'm not declaring an emergency, but if you can give me priority so I can get down safely, I'm not comfortable flying, you know, that sort of thing, right? But if visibility is bad, that is definitely an emergency situation, right? Like if you're in IFR or if, you know, God forbid you're a VFR pilot, but visibility has declined and it's really bad and then you lose your vacuum system, then you would want to call uh, an emergency so they make sure you have full priority and all that and they can help you out, you know, with radar and stuff like that, because that would definitely be an emergency if you don't know and your attitude and all that stuff in low visibility. So it makes it tougher, as we mentioned, to determine your attitude with things like the airspeed indicator, VSI and altimeter. All right. So that's it. I expanded on a few things, talking about things you might learn in IFR to give a little more context on these things. But pretty much it's, right, the vacuum gauge, if it goes to zero, then you got to use other instruments. And 
If visibility is getting poor, then it's an emergency and get down safely. All right, so the last lesson we're going to cover today is lesson five on radio failures. And again, this is in section 17 on emergencies. So lesson five on radio failures. All right, again, disclaimer, your aircraft is probably different. It might be different. This procedure does apply to every aircraft, but some of the procedure does not apply to every aircraft. So do your homework and know what relates and what it, the procedure is for your specific aircraft and talk to your CFI about that. Just use this as a learning tool. All right, let's get into it. If your radio fails in flight, this can make things extremely difficult, particularly if you're traveling to or through controlled airspace. You'll want to land as soon as possible and to do the general procedure, which is observe the traffic flow, enter the pattern, and look for a light signal from the tower. So remember those light signals that we covered a while back when you have lost comms and you look at the from the tower, they're going to have this like light signal gun and they're going to give you a green or a flashing green or a red or flashing red. And that kind of each one of those has a meaning and then you rock your wings when you understand what they're telling you and that's how you communicate. So that's what we're talking about here. However, there are more things you will want to do and try to recover your radio or see if there's any of your radios are partially operational. So if your radio fails, you can perform the following steps or something like the following steps. Again, disclaimer, it might be different for your aircraft. First off, you want to turn your radio off and back on. The good old turn it off, turn it back on, right? Just like your Nintendo 64. Check the volume of the radio to make sure it is up high enough. Don't make that dumb mistake that, oh shoot, the volume was just down. Make sure the volume's down. Make sure that you're on the right, if you're the aircraft has multiple radios, right? And then on top of that, you want to try switching between radios, all right? Maybe just one radio is not working, so and the other radio is. Again, that's one of the reasons they have multiple radios. Try different radio frequencies and say radio check, right? Try the CTAF, the Unicom. If you can't contact tower and you need to contact tower, try the ground control. Try the flight following, you know, try a few of them. You know, at least, I would try at least three before I gave up trying different frequencies and, and just say, hey, November 4659 or radio check, right? And they would say, hear, hear you loud and clear, or you would get nothing back, right? And I would do that on both radios. Okay, I would try it out, try that on one radio with like three different frequencies, then I would try it on another radio at three different frequencies. Check the overhead speaker. Sometimes these aircraft, these older aircraft have like these overhead speakers, and those can be on, so you you could like have the speaker activated so that your headset's not even working because the sound signals are going through the speaker. So check that if your aircraft has something like that. Then check your headphone connections. Maybe do this first, right? But definitely something at some point do this. Unplug and plug back in and maybe try the passenger seat, right? So unplug from the pilot side, plug it back in. If that doesn't work, plug it into the passenger side seat and see if that works might just be your connection on your side. And then check circuit breakers. Maybe the radio system circuit breakers popped out, you know, shorted it, and you could pop those back in, turn everything off, pop those back in, and then turn them back on. See if that helps. If none of, you know, and then your aircraft might have additional systems or something that you can turn back off or turn back on or change a setting here or there or something like that. The last thing here that I want to add is sometimes you might have your button, the transmit button, right? The mic key, that button <laughs> that you hold down when you talk. Make sure it's not like stuck down or something, right? It could, you could just be transmitting the whole time. And so that when you press it down further or something, nothing changes. That could be a problem. Or maybe like if you have another headset plugged in or the passenger side one is held down or, or broken or something like that. So that's another thing you might want to try. If none of that works, to get your radio back. And obviously you would want to do this at a safe altitude, safe location, circling, trimmed, you know, our aircraft uh, away from traffic and dangerous situations while we do all this so we can focus on this stuff. But don't also forget to, you know, look out for traffic and things like that. Maybe do one thing at a time, right? And then check traffic, check the attitude of your aircraft, check your airspeed, check your sight picture, look for traffic as you circle around and then come back and do the next thing. If none of that works, Squawk 7600 on your transponder. Rem remember that? We had those transponder codes. 7600 was the lost comms one. So 
that's going to tell, that's going to signal out as long as your transponder is still working to ATC around you that you are lost comms. So this is very important for ATC to help you out accurately, right? Then you want to call out transmitting blind. The reason you want to do this is ATC might still be able to hear you this whole time. They might be, every time you did radio check, they might be able to hear you, but you can't hear them. You don't know which one it is. It could be, it could be both, right? You can't transmit and you can't hear, or it could just be you can transmit and you can hear, or it could be you can't transmit, but you can hear, right? So it could be any combination of those. So you want to call it transmitting blind because if they can hear you, then now they know, okay, he's transmitting blind and you can still transmit things as you do them in case they can still hear you because it still would be very helpful if they can hear you at least. Then you'll want to observe the traffic flow. What does that mean exactly? Well, you're going to come in to where you can see the traffic pattern, but you're going to come in and you're going to circle at a safe altitude and distance away from the traffic pattern somewhere few hundred feet above the traffic pattern and maybe off away from the traffic pattern and where aircraft are entering the tra- or exiting the traffic pattern, right? So you want to do that there, circle, observe the traffic flow. Same time, I would start looking at the tower. You know, you squawk 7600, you said transmitting blind, they might and should start to give you some sort of light signals, right? You also want to check the wind sock, right? You want to make sure you know the wind and so you know which runway they're doing landings on and you know what wind you'll have for landing. And then let's say you don't get a a light signal to join the traffic pattern, or you even if you do, you're going to want to enter the pattern on the downwind of the traffic pattern when there's an opening from other aircraft. So you want to observe the traffic, make sure there's good clearance, and then enter at a 45 degree on the downwind. And then you want to wait and watch the tower for light signals. To acknowledge you receive the light signal, During the day, rock your wings. During the night, flash your lights at regular intervals. Okay, so that kind of tells you, hey, I got the light signal. 7600 is deemed an emergency squawk code for radio failures. However, if flying in class Echo or Golf airspace where two-way communication with ATC is not required, a radio failure is not exactly considered an emergency, right? Because you're not really talking to anybody. Anyways, you're kind of talking to CTAF. So you want to be careful. You want to make sure that you observe traffic and all that stuff, if there is any, but it's not deemed an emergency in that situation. Now, there might be some questions that come up, like what if you don't receive light signals? Well, I would continue to fly. If this was me, I would continue to fly in that circle that's safe, you know, where I'm observing the traffic flow. I would, you know, squawk 7600, call out transmitting blind. I would continue to circle in that safe area pretty much for as long as is safe. Maybe give it, I don't know, 15 minutes while you're you're looking for a a light signal from the tower. After that, it's probably a good call that, I don't know, they're not getting, you know, maybe your transponder code isn't getting to them or maybe they're having an off day. They don't even notice that you're there. No one's told them or anything that you can enter safely by yourself without a light signal. But I would I would give it as much time as possible. You know, if you're running low on fuel, obviously you want to do what you got to do to get down. But I would give them time. I wouldn't be impatient about it. I would stay in that safe circle waiting for their light signal. If, you know, you're running out of fuel or if it's been a while, you know, maybe even 20 minutes or longer, then safely enter, you know, with a gap in the traffic flow and just come on in to land. But look, still looking whole time for the tower. Even if, you may enter the pattern, and then they may give you a red light at that point. And then at that point, I would acknowledge and do accordingly to whatever light signal you got. So that's it. That is our lesson. That is our episode. It was a long one, but a lot of good information in here. Next week, we will continue on with our section on emergencies. We have engine fire. We will talk about what to do on an engine fire, what to do in an electrical fire, And then what to do in an engine failure right after liftoff, okay? So that's kind of one of the, probably the most dangerous time to lose engine power. You just took off, you're low, you're slow. What the heck do we do if that happens? So we'll talk about that situation all on next week's episode. Thank you guys so much for always joining me. Please, you know, leave us a review. It really helps us out and share this podcast with all your friends. All right, talk to you later.
I wanted to thank Nick from Part-Time Pilot for putting together a great ground school course for private pilots. This is not the first online private pilot ground school I have taken, but it is the one that has best prepared me for my FAA written exam. Unlike my other online ground school, I was able to complete the part-time pilot during the week and then pass my written exam on the weekend. It's just crazy. More importantly, Part-Time Pilot provides resources to help student pilots like myself navigate the flight training industry by teaching you what is required every step of the way. As someone who's previously gone through ground school and have been woefully underprepared to continue flight training in the past, I cannot stress enough how valuable taking ownership of your flight training curriculum through the methods that Part-Time Pilot makes available is. Now, as I work through my checkride prep course, I'm looking to bring that same confidence to my checkride. Thanks, Nick.